and welcome to Procrastination Baking where I am going to bake things instead of doing other stuff that I should really be doing right now. So initially I was going to call this Procrastinate Baking and then realised it sounded a lot like something else you really shouldn't do in a kitchen without at least a lot of disinfectant happening afterwards. I would say bleach. You, would, you should bleach if you do that in your kitchen. Use, use bleach and then maybe reevaluate your life. Yeah, that's that's the steps that you should take. Bleach and then life reevaluation. So, what we're going to be cooking in are three gluten free desserts because I found that gluten free food tastes like crap or it doesn't taste anything like what it's supposed to or what you would be expecting. Like you make a gluten-free sandwich with your mum's bread and it tastes like you're eating cake with ham, which is never a good combination. I would say don't do that. I know people put bacon in cooking and that seems like something I should try one day, but ham, tomato sauce on cake, not so much. So what we're gonna be doing is three desserts There'll be three separate videos, each one will have its own little storyline or possible calamity that I do in the kitchen. So the first one's going to be caramel slice because it takes the longest because I boil condensed milk to make caramel and that takes hours and you will come along for the ride because I made this video and you are now watching it. So really, who's at fault here? Me. Probably me. I'm at fault. I'm making it and then you're watching it. I, that's a... Hmm. Anyway, so caramel slice. And a bonus in this video is where you see that I nearly cut off my toes. Yeah, you can do that while making caramel slice. Or at least I can do that when making caramel slice. So let's go. So for this recipe, what you need is at least three tins of condensed milk. Um, what you're going to do is remove the labels safely, probably not with a knife aimed towards your face. You're then going to put them into a pot to boil. The reason that you are removing the labels is basically so that you don't have the punishment of having to clean the glue that will dissolve in the water later and make you want to cause harm to the inventors of said glue when it takes you at least 30 minutes to scrub it off the inside of your pot. So then we're going to put it on to boil. You're probably not going to do what I did here where I found another two tins of condensed milk and thought, ruin idea, I will boil those as well. I did need them for another recipe but Essentially what I've done here is I've overcrowded the pot and then had to move them to another pot to boil and chose the most dangerous method I could think of to take them out of said pot. So probably don't do what I'm doing here where you get a flimsy set of tongs and proceed to burn yourself with boiled water when you drop the tin back into said water. Yes, that's right, I thought that this was a better idea. Probably still not a great idea. I did sort of perfect it towards the end, but I do drop one back in, yep, there we go. And did attempt to try and remove it with my hand. Yes. Did I also mention that um, this t process takes three hours of boiling? So don't start it at 10 o'clock at night and then realize that you have to hang around and make sure that it doesn't boil dry and explode. So what you're going to do is you're going to babysit this for three hours. You're going to make sure that the water never gets below the top of the tin because as my mother tells me, my auntie once, or a relative, I can't really remember, 
once boiled a pot dry when trying to boil condensed milk and it exploded all over the kitchen. And that is like lava exploding in your kitchen. Probably something I don't want to happen. So yes, this riveting footage is me filling up another pot. And we will then change the burners over so that the other pot is on the hottest burner, which is that back burner. And I will now tell you the secret to the best boiled condensed milk caramel. I don't know why I decided that this one needed to be in the other pot and that one. I, I, I'm sure there was some logic at the time, but yeah, no, no, we'll, we'll just do that. That seems like a good idea. Yeah. We'll move that one instead. Okay. So once again, the timing for this is around three hours. So you're going to boil this for about three hours. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to bring the water up to a rolling boil. Once it's at that, you will turn off the burner. Let the water settle back down to just below a simmer. And then once that happens, check the water level, top it up if you need to, then bring it back to a boil. Continue this process for at least three hours. Then once this process is completed, what you will do is you will turn off the burners and allow the caramel to sit in the hot water until the water gets cool enough that you can remove the tins with your hands. Now the water is still going to be warm. The tins will be hot on the bottom. Do not touch the bottom of them. Okay, so now to create the base, you're going to need gluten-free self-raising flour, brown sugar, desiccated coconut, if that's how you say it, and uh, that coconut that's all crushed up, and you're going to need some butter. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure out uh, at least 200 grams of butter. So here I am measuring that out accurately to around, I think it actually came into about 209 grams, but you want at least 200 grams of butter. Um, anything less than that and you're going to have a base that's actually tastes quite floury. Um, this will create a true biscuit base that will taste like any other biscuit base. It won't actually taste gluten free, which is the key to creating this caramel slice. So chop your butter up, keep chopping, chop, chop, chop. Again, we're going to use a knife that is really too big for the purpose of what we're doing right now. And then we're going to melt that in the microwave. So you want it completely melted. Yep, we're going to just... So in your mixing bowl, you're going to want one cup of self-raising flour, gluten-free flour, any gluten-free self-raising flour, whatever's the cheapest is all that I ever use. Flour is flour, gluten-free flour is gluten-free flour. And after you measure that and like dump it into a bowl and spill some of it on the bench. You're going to then want a half a cup of brown sugar. I wonder why it's called brown sugar. One moment, I'm just going to Google why, it, why it's called brown sugar. And you can see that you're accurately going to measure that out by still using the cup measuring device that you used for the one cup. And you're just going to guess that you got half. And then you're going to get one cup of coconut. 
and you're gonna accurately measure that like that like always fold down your bag over the top of the bowl anything that spills in then becomes yummy food now we're gonna mix this together yeah this just makes it easier when you pour the milk in no oh, not milk butter melted butter that's what you're gonna be putting in it um, so mixing it all together like this just means that mixing that melted butter in is going to create a more even distribution you get your butter that you've successfully nuked down to liquid lava and then you're going to mix that all together and you're going to use a whisk even though you really should use a spatula because that would stop you from having all of the stuff mixing up and getting stuck inside of the whisk blades are they blades i don't know whatever those metal bits of a whisk called i'm going to come back to why it's called brown sugar because i'm going to google that I will probably put it in here somewhere. And yep, yeah, so we're going to mix all that together, get it all stuck inside of that whisk. So you basically have to deconstruct the whisk to get it all out of there. And then you're going to take. Oh, no, we're going to clean down. Wow. Being fancy and cleaning down your bench. Really, who do I think is going to see? Oh, all of you but you can admire my slippers or my house shoes as I like to call them they are Hogwarts and I am wearing a Doctor Who Doctor Who? Doctor Who apron so what you're going to do is you're going to get one of these like disposable tray things because then you don't have to do washing up and you got to line it with some baking paper and if you crimp the corners in the way I'm doing here, then it actually stays up a little bit better in the baking process and stops it from getting all down inside the corners and I don't know, there's obviously some form of logic that I thought at 11 o'clock at night required this much work. And then you're going to take your base and you're going to squish it in. You're going to just squish it down into all of the corners and you know just push it down there make it all flat you don't want any hills or anything or you just want some nice flat base for your caramel deliciousness to sit on you're basically creating a bed for the caramel yep squish it down squish 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 and more squishing obviously squish that yep yep there we go pat pat chuck it in the oven now the oven's on about 180 and you're going to do it for 10 minutes and then after 10 minutes you're going to steam up the camera and then you're going to turn that bugger around so that it continues baking for another five minutes and gets all hot enough to melt all that butter and make it all bubbly and steam up the camera again and then you're going to sit it out and you're going to let it rest and your caramel's just finished so you're going to get all your caramel and you're going to open all of the tins because they're there they need to be opened so you will do that now you only actually need about three tins for this caramel slice like I said previously, I'm using the other tins for another recipe that you'll get in a couple of days. Um, so that's why I'm opening so much and distributing out so much at the moment. You, of course, will only have the sensible amount of three tins of condensed milk caramel. But look at that caramel deliciousness. Really, can you have enough caramel? The answer to that question is no. No, you cannot.
Okay, so now that you've got all of your tins open, you're going to just basically plump it all down inside the tray. You're also going to set up your camera angles so that most of what you're actually trying to film is going to be off camera. But what I'm doing here is basically just scooping the caramel out of the tin and dumping it in the middle of the tin. Lots of tins. There we go, doesn't that look delicious? I am not eating the caramel. Okay, so now we're going to start the process of smoothing this caramel out. Essentially, you're just going to take a knife and you're going to squish it up and then smooth it all out into the different corners of the tin. Realistically, caramel slice can never have too much caramel. This might take some time, but it will be worth it in the end. So the key to this is that you do it while the caramel is still a little bit warm. That way it will spread easier. If the caramel is cold, it will take longer to spread. There we go. So the next step is the chocolate coating. For that, you're going to get a bag of Nestle milk chocolate melts. They are gluten free. Always check but because you never know when a company is just going to decide that they no longer want to be gluten free. At the moment, at time of making this, Nestle melts, milk chocolate melts were gluten free. And hopefully they still are because they are delicious. So you're going to take the entire, it's the smaller packet out of the two options that you get. And you're going to melt that. Always do it in 30 second lots to start with. Because it's quite easy to burn chocolate if you, pour, you, like, you do it for too long without stirring it in between. So this time around took approximately two 30 second lots plus 15 seconds at the end to just finish it off. Mm, 
look at that like magic it's all melted so stir it all up make sure there's no clumps of unmelted chocolate in there there'll be enough residual heat in the chocolate to melt any any that haven't fully melted so what you're going to do is you're going to let it set up on your bench and then you're going to score it take it from me who has done this many times and skip this step this is going to save you the nightmare of cracked chocolate in the morning when you pull it out of the fridge and you have to cut up the little squares so you want the chocolate to be firm enough to put a score line but not set You can see there towards the end it was a little bit more firm and started to crack. Chuck it in the fridge for, uh, till the next morning and then you're going to take it out. You're going to put it on a cutting board. Look at that shiny clean pan. You can use that for something else. And what you're going to do, and this is important, you're going to take the largest knife that you have in and sharpest knife and you're going to use that to cut up your caramel slice even though it's overkill and then what you're going to do is you're going to cut into the first piece right here and then proceed to drop the knife next to your foot where you could have severed your toes you're then going to clean the same knife and finish the job you started. So before, so because I'm going to be transferring this to a like the presentation platter, whatever you want to call it, later I'm just shoving it into some Tupperware for the transfer from my house to my sister's place, where it's going to be enjoyed for its deliciousness and feed my mother, who's gluten free as well as everyone else that is at the residence at the time that this is presented. The key to it is making something gluten free that doesn't taste gluten free. And if you eat gluten free, you know exactly what I mean by taste gluten free. It either will be floury, it will be overly sweet, it will be incredibly dense or way too soft to be natural where what we're trying to achieve is something that anyone can pick up and enjoy and actually ask the question is this gluten free and what you can see there is the ratio of caramel to biscuit base that you want. You always want at least double the caramel to the biscuit base. 
if you have too much biscuit base that's all you're going to taste and it's not called biscuit base slice it's called caramel slice so make the caramel count and I hope you've enjoyed this and you make it yourself and let me know how it goes let me know if there's something else you'd like me to attempt to create that's gluten free and delicious and look out for my next two videos one will be profiteroles gluten free and the other the gluten free classic lamington and good night kind sir or man or whoever you are <laughs>